So whether my research uh, involves interaction with government authorities and so on, uh, the, the answer to that is very much yes. Uh, I've, I've worked extensively over the last um, too many years, or all of this century, <laughs> uh, uh, in uh, academia, but I've spent times, uh, periods of time working in the British government, uh, and I've had a lot of interaction over the years, particularly with the UK government, but also internationally with the uh, European Commission, uh, other European countries, uh, Australia. Uh, I'm, I'm going to the US uh, next week uh, to talk about energy policy. So, I mean, I think you need to understand the UK situation as an evolution of, of, uh, of ideas over a period of perhaps uh, 20 or even 30 years. Because uh, in the UK in the early 1990s, the, the, the principal focus for energy policy was uh, privatisation, liberalisation and the competitive markets to improve efficiency and reduce costs. Now, there was some attention to environmental issues and concern about, for example, acid rain. Um, and that was within the kind of regu regulation and the, the legislation. But really, the big change in, in the UK started to occur in the early 2000s. Uh, and that's when uh, Tony Blair, when he was the Prime Minister, uh, uh, recognised that climate change was a really significant threat, uh, the biggest threat to, to, to humanity in the coming century. And at that time, uh, the formulation of energy policy in the UK was changed. Whereas previously it had been something that said, we want to encourage competitive markets, low prices and protection of the environment. It was changed and it placed reduction of carbon emissions at the top of the list of objectives for energy policy. Now, some people would argue that um, the UK had aspirations and its aspirations were bigger than the policies that it was had available to deliver. Uh, and you might argue that that was the case during the mid-2000s, although we did have a renewables obligation here, and we did have uh, energy efficiency policies and other things. But in 2008, a very significant thing happened. Uh, we had uh, the Climate Change Act, following on from the stern review of the economics of climate change, and that placed the government on a path from 2008 and in further detail in 2010 to have a, a, a first a 60% but then an 80% target for decarbonisation in 2050. And that really drove energy policy to focus very strongly on carbon abatement and we were also through the European Union Renewables Directive had a strong focus on renewables and that led to lots of policy uh, changes to promote low carbon. Yes, the, the way that the, the balance of risk has changed for investors in the UK between price and policy is um, uh, under uh, the liberalised markets, or any market really, for, for electricity, whether it's privatised or otherwise, uh, wholesale prices will change. And wholesale prices tend to change historically because fossil fuel is historically, in many countries at least, the main uh, source of energy for uh, electricity and as you as everybody is aware we've all seen gas prices go up and gas prices go down and these this affects the electricity price that creates risk for investors in renewables because they can't respond to those price changes also for nuclear um, and so one solution to this is to provide uh, investors in renewables or uh, nu nuclear in the UK, we include nuclear within the, uh, within the framework, to provide them with a long run fixed price uh, of electricity so that they can invest uh, with certainty. That's fine once the investors have secured a contract. Uh, the problem at the, in the UK at the moment is there's a lot of uncertainty about whether or not a contract will be available, how much budget will be available. And so if you're considering making an investment in the uh, renewable sector in the UK or even in new nuclear, and you're looking into the future, you might have to spend um, five years or longer to develop a project. And you might have to spend tens of millions of pounds, euros, 
uh, to develop your projects, but you'd have complete uncertainty about whether or not you would get a contract because the political uncertainty is, is very significant at the moment. So that's, that's, that's the difficulty, that one of the difficulties, I think. So the UK's main asset in, 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 uh, in, in a transition, uh, in terms of energy resources, uh, the UK has uh, fantastic marine uh, resources. So uh, because it's an island, uh, we're able to uh, benefit from the, the space that's available to us to install offshore wind. So we've already installed, um, I can't remember the, the precise number, but it's something like seven or eight gigawatts of offshore wind. And the theoretical capacity for offshore wind exceeds electricity supply many times. So that's one asset which, uh, which the UK has. Uh, the, the UK also is the windiest country in Europe, so it has very good onshore wind. Uh, opportunities to use tidal energy and, uh, and perhaps in the future wave power. But I think that one of the things that people forget, you ask about the resource for the transition, the greatest resource for the transition in any country is human capacity because making the transition is going to be as much about software as it is about hardware and it's going to be about thinking about how we make a change. Um, and so the UK has some advantages in terms of some very good universities and some very uh, leading edge companies. But other countries and other parts of Europe also have real strengths in, in many of these areas. I think renewable energy is close to being mainstream. I think that uh, we are seeing uh, power purchase agreements that are struck in countries which have good solar or wind resources that are already competitive with wholesale prices, fossil fuel based prices. I think the, the, the system that we have, so when I say the system I, I mean the, the, the physical system like the wires uh, and the gas pipes and the coal trains and the power stations but I also mean the institutions and the markets and the wholesale market and the, and, uh, the laws. They've all been set up around basically a fossil fuel based system. So it will take a, a considerable period of time, probably decades, for us to change that whole system including the institutions uh, and to make it more uh, suitable for re renewables. So we're in a process, of, you're right to call it a transition, we are in a process of transition. We've been in a process of transition in my view since the early to mid 1990s when renewables started to become significant. Right, so um, what, the, uh, what the research evidence shows is that different, uh, in all countries there are a range of views about renewables. So even in the countries where wind energy is being very popular, there's still a, uh, some sections of the public which remain opposed. Uh, the question is uh, how vocal those sections of the public might be and um, certainly in the UK what we've seen is that there have been very visible, uh, very vocal uh, campaigns of local community groups to oppose wind farms. Two or three newspapers decided to become quite antagonistic towards, main big newspapers uh, became antagonistic towards wind farms. So it was very much, it was wind that was being targeted, not renewables in general, because of concern about beautiful landscapes. So now we have a moratorium on wind, new onshore wind in the UK, which is very unfortunate because it's the cheapest form of, of renewable energy and it doesn't, obviously you have to be sensitive about the siting of it, but um, I think how you overcome that is a, is a very complex question. Uh, because it, it runs, certainly if you have more community ownership, you build more um, support for wind energy. Um, also, I think you need to have uh, more education and information and understanding. Uh, but in many uh, areas of public policy in the UK, um, I think we do suffer in particular from having uh, some newspapers which are, can be very distorting of uh, what I would say they distort the truth and they're misleading people and some aspects of energy policy fall into that area. <laughs>